Hello everyone, it's Joseph here and today I have the great honor of hosting a very special guest. Mr. Steve Ramirez is a plasma specialist in genetic diseases and is also the author of the award-winning novel The Great Migration, which you all know was the book of the month for January at onlinebookclub.org. Mr. Steve Ramirez, thank you so much for joining me here today. I'm really grateful. Yeah, I'm really glad you were able to join me. Thank you so much. So uh, to begin, I read that you're a plasma specialist in genetic diseases by occupation. Yeah, so I got curious. Uh, please, what gave you the motivation to write a novel, a fiction novel like that? You know, it's funny. Um, I I'd never really thought about writing a book before. And I was um, watching the TV show Game of Thrones, and I was upset with the way it ended because um, we had waited like two years for the final season. And through the conversations with my wife about how frustrated I was with the way we had been disappointed with the endings of some of the shows we had been watching. Like we'd get six, seven seasons in and it seemed like they just walked away from the story to end the show. And I had asked her, she said, why is it such a big deal to you? And I, I said, well, is it really so hard to end a story? Like, you know, like what all these endings seem so abrupt. I mean, is it really that challenging? And she was, I think, a little frustrated with me. And she said, I don't know. Why don't you go over to your computer, write a story and find out? And that was literally how I started writing. I thought, yeah, OK, I will. And um, I think because I had Game of Thrones on my mind, the story I had initially started to write was a fantasy setting, kind of along the lines of Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings. But I didn't. I love to watch fantasy stuff. I, I love to read fantasy books and all that, play fantasy style video games. But I didn't like to write, I didn't find writing that type of story to to be my cup of tea, so to speak. Um, like you said, I have more of a, a medical science background. I'm a little more literal in uh, the way I express myself. And, um, so I, I I told my wife after about a month, I said, you know, I, I think I can science fiction this plot line. I'm just going to have to study some physics to make sure my impressions are accurate. So I spent the summer um, just kind of diving into general relativity. Um, I wanted to, you know, obviously you read the book, I, I have to study some AI um, developments, uh, quantum computing, you know, see if my speculation would be any way feasible. And then, of course, quantum mechanics worked in there. And I didn't, you know, obviously, I don't have a degree in physics. I just wanted to spend enough time to get the plot points of the story accurate, or at least feasible in a science fiction style of presentation. And, that, and that's how the whole thing came to be. It just, it became, I really took to it, and I really enjoyed it. And I spent a lot of time driving and that afforded me a lot of opportunity to get, you know, do audiobooks on the subject matter. So, you know, um, like the world building or, um, like I said, general relativity. I, I was able to, through Audible, to download a lot of lecture series on physics or on gravity or, you know, everything that you see in the book, I would just listen to the books, take my notes. When I got to the hotel that night, I would compile all the notes, try to keep track of everything, highlight the stuff I thought that was going to be usable, and then find places to strategically add it to kind of add realism to the story and inform the, the reader that, you know, this isn't some outlandish tale. I mean, it is outlandish, obviously. <laughs> but, um, I, I wanted to impress upon the reader that there was an element of realism to what they were reading. So you actually research to write a fiction novel. I mean, I thought people only do research when they're writing like a scientific novel or studies, but you research physics to write this fiction novel. That's so applaudable. Uh, <laughs> it was fun. I enjoy learning and general relativity. The idea that the, the flow, the relative flow of time, the way we perceive it is completely unique to our perception and, and, and like i'm in, in relation to the galaxy i'm very close to you we're in the very we're in the same type of gravity uh field because we're both on earth yeah. time is passing similarly for us through our relative perception of it you know what i mean like especially if you were in heavy gravity or you know in proximity to let's say a black hole for an extreme example 
time would be flowing in in a way that would keep us from ever understanding what was happening to a person in that that um like like position yeah. and it's it's just an amazing concept and to think that somebody figured that out and then it all is actually true it is was mind-blowing to me i i uh, really enjoyed doing the research for this book wow that's very impressive you actually put a lot of effort and it's paid off it really did so um, i couldn't help but observe that this book the great migration it had a ton of things and ideas all bobbing around you know with the fever the invasion the old extraterrestrial drama so when did you discover this evidence passion for science fiction i remember i had seen a lecture on um this virologist, a uh, person who studies viruses, was talking about pande pandemics and epidemics and threats to public health. He had said, he was speculating on th the rabies virus. And the rabies virus is quite terrifying. Um, wow. But it's also not very, you know, it's not communicable in like a classic kind of way. I mean, you have, you know, obviously we all know if a rabbit animal bites you, then, you know, it can transmit that way. But he was talking about the threat of like, let's say rabies at some point were to mutate or merge with like an influenza virus and talking about what the hell would look like. And it, because of this person's credentials, I was like, wait, is this, is this a thing? Is this even a possibility? Or, more importantly, could somebody bioengineer that? Because that would be terrifying as well. And that, that was years ago. But I had that in my head this whole time because it was so astonishing to me to think about. So when I started writing this book, I thought, man, that, that would be... I wonder if there's a way I could work this into the story. <laughs> and that's where I came up with the idea for the, the Sorn Fever. Wow, your whole journey writing this book just seems like the adventure. Now, let's talk about this book being your debut novel. I must commend you. It just shows that you have this gift right from time because The Great Migration was a finalist in the 2021 Wishing Shelf Book Awards for Adult Fiction. And you know, Book of the Month at onlinebooklog.org. It was so well received. So um, how exactly did you discover your gift of writing? That... That was a work in progress because I hadn't written creatively since high school and that was a long time ago. <laughs> so I very much depended on my beta readers. I, when I was, when I decided to take this seriously, I started to research the process of writing. And in every source I learned from, they would say, you need beta readers. You need people to read like you need to make the best effort to write something, do your first, second, third draft, and then you need to present that to people to read and give you honest feedback. So the first, you know, drafts of this thing, I mean, I, I wrote that first chapter, if you can believe it, 36 times. Then the first time I wrote it, it was a disaster. You know, I couldn't read well. You know, I didn't know what I was doing, but because I had such great beta readers and because I had so many of them, there, and they were very honest with me and you know it can be a little jarring at first because it's you know it's criticism but it's it's necessary to get to the final product and what i used was and this wasn't something i came up with it was advice from another information source but they said use the rule of threes if you get enough beta readers if you have 12 to 15 20 people reading your material then use the rule of threes meaning if three people say the same thing then accept that as truth. So if they sit each, if you have three people giving you the same negative feedback, regardless of how you feel about that particular part of the material, delete it, get it out of there or change it drastically. If three people are saying something positive, regardless of how you feel about it, leave it in there. And that was a very functional way to get to a readable book without any writing experience because it allows you to write the same thing over and over and over until you finally dial it in and then those same beta readers after going chapter by chapter i would give them 
the first third of the book or the second third, or I would give them entire scenes like in Gerdin. Um, and they would read those start to finish and they'd be like, yeah, that now it's starting to come together. And that was really, really, I mean, that takes a long time because, you know, people are giving you their time. You have to call them. You have to, you know, I found some questionnaires online that were very objective in their approach to the work and they would either fill them out and send them to me. And then I'd call them and we would talk about it. Um, the people that were extraordinarily busy would just fill them out and send them back to me with as many notes as they could give. Um, but you know, you got to work around everybody's schedule. And I think that was part of the reason the first, there were many reasons the first book took so much longer than the second and third, but I worked on it. It was funny. I had intended to just work on it when I was in hotels because I travel a lot for work and I ended up becoming kind of obsessed. And it was like every night, all the weekends, just going, going, going. It was a lot of fun, but my life got a little out of balance. So I'm continuing to write, but now I do it at a much more relaxed pace. I don't tell anybody what I'm working on specifically. And, um, you know, it will probably drastically extend my time to finish but it will be funner because i couldn't make because i work full time it, it there was not a lot of room in my life for anything besides work and writing you know what i mean and uh, i i'm i'm trying not to do that again because i'm married and you know you gotta prioritize your marriage your partner and your life and so this is a it's a very nice thing to still do but uh, that's that's how the book came out at that level because that book that you see has been rewritten many many times joseph those garden chapters like there's for the for the people that are watching that haven't read the book there's the main story and then about 100 pages in we depart to a different area with yeah. different characters it's yeah. almost like that's a story within a story joseph i gotta tell you my original idea for this story was to have, there were characters in those Garden chapters that I had intended to escape that disaster and and go on. And I thought that was gonna be, that was my original idea for the book. But in writing to get there, the story had just taken on a life of its own. And then once I got to those chapters, um, even with the book, you know, those hundred pages prior to that being written, I had a very different intention for the ending of those chapters and I just couldn't make it happen because I kept saying, well, that's not realistic. What's realistic is this. And the more realistic I stayed, the more my oh, idea for those chapters fell apart. I'm like, I don't think I can write that. And I got to that final Garrett chapter, right? I mean, I wrote that thing like 20 times. I could not get it to go any other way than the way it went. I'm like, well, I guess, I guess this is what's going to happen. And then I had to stop and think, okay, well, and luckily there was so much going on elsewhere that I didn't have a lot of trouble filling in the rest of the book. I, I think I, because I, this is, that was the first book I'd ever written. I didn't realize how much space these storylines were going to take. I mean, that book could have easily been a thousand pages. I mean, I cut out before I, before I, wrote the climax i cut out like 120 pages there was like another 10 named characters there was a whole different storyline going on it was just too much you know i i, I was like okay th this is overwhelming as it is because a lot of people are like look there's a lot of characters and there was a lot going on and all i could think was you should have seen that first draft i mean it was like, i mean it was that book was bound to be a thousand pages and nobody's publishing a thousand page book from a first time author. It was, it's just too much. So I had to really start streamlining. And I think in a way those Gearden chapters um, ended up being a big blessing in that it, like you said, it's just a story within a story that kind of tells the reader about everything that's happening. So that's a Gearden chapter. There were so many unexpected scenes that completely blew my mind. I'm not going to give any spoilers, but those chapters just threw me off. If you are going to read this book, I promise you need to check it out. Those those things were just crazy. Now I have another question. Uh, your occupation as a plasma specialist. Um, I've got an idea or two, but I would like to hear it from you. How did your studies in genetic diseases influence the plot of this novel? You're exactly right, and be because. Um, the genetic disease that I work with is, is a very specific 
gene mutation. It's it's one gene, and it governs the production of a, a specific protein that helps protect our lungs. In a healthy person, it's a very important part of our immune system. But in the people that are deficient, they they, they lack a layer of protection that will result in emphysema if they go untreated regardless of if they smoke or not you know they just get it naturally so in the industry because that gene mutation is so specific there's always talk about a ge- curing this disease at the genetic level and there's new technology coming out and always being developed um, where we can edit we're, we're hoping someday to be able to effectively edit a person's genes thereby curing genetic diseases like the one that I work in. So that's always a part of my reality. And, you know, we're always thinking, well, when is a realistic timeline? There's all these speculations. But any time I go to a conference on this disease, that is a big topic of discussion. And it's not hard to think, geez, if we, if someday we master these types of diseases that are very specific, it's only logical to think that Genetic engineering will expand to, you know, enhance our health, um, make us more robust. And in those books, you know, not to do any spoilers, but there's some speculation on, you know, how much genetic engineering has a place in this story and why there's such disparity between the SORN and the humans. And that's that's just what I want to add. This is, you know, Typically, I read nonfiction, and I, you know, the more speculative the nonfiction, a lot of times that makes it more interesting. And so, I like a lot of these books that reach out to things like this. So, I had all this information swirling around in my head, and when I started to put the plot lines of this book together, I thought, "Hey!" And I, I, luckily, I had still have all these books. I was like, "Hey, I could borrow from that book. I could borrow from this book." But that's where a lot of those storylines came from. Is you know, like you said, in my world, we're talking very specific genes there's just no way it doesn't expand beyond that at some point in time they're just the scientists developing it the doctors that will be utilizing it will continue to push it forward and see what its capacity to change human lives and you know agriculture it it, it seems like anything that has genes to think about especially when you consider how quickly it's moving forward Wow, it's been a great discussion and sadly we only have a few minutes left. But before we go, I would like to ask for your advice to people who have this dream of writing but their careers do not give them the liberty to create a masterpiece like you've done. So what would you say to people in this position? Uh, My advice is to, to do it. And I don't mean write a book. What I mean is start to write it. If you're feeling that way, you've probably got an idea or two in your head. Start to write some notes on it, put it into perspective, and understand that in modern times with access to the internet, you don't have to know how to do something because the information is out there for you to learn. And don't learn everything from one source, get a variety of sources. And if it's how to develop characters, how to develop a plot line, how to take notes or do research, whatever it is, do that specifically. And if the idea of writing a book is overwhelming, then break it down into smaller tasks. Say, this is how I'm, today I'm gonna learn how to develop a character and then get four or five opinions on that. And before you know it, you're gonna start to feel comfortable with the idea of the process or the idea of your story or the idea of your characters. It's a step-by-step thing. If you're writing fiction, I would say stay flexible in your, stay flexible in your approach to the story. Because as I said, the story I had intended is not the one that came out. At some point, the characters and the world and the situation took over and I was just kind of following it along, trying to do it justice as it, as it, appeared before me so to speak and it was a it was interesting and it was unexpected but if i had stuck to my creative guns and said no 
destroy one is this it, it wouldn't have worked because it wouldn't have made any sense at all <laughs> you know the, the story is the story and i think if you've got enough there eventually it will come to it will come to life and then your only task is to keep pace with it and like i said do it justice but but do all the work get your beta readers you know edit like take it seriously if you really want to and there's no reason it won't be published i self-publish you know through amazon it's something everybody can do but writing a book worth reading is not something everybody can do but it's something everybody can't what i should say is not everybody's going to be willing to put in the work but if you are willing to put in the work that's going to put you ahead of most people you know the work being the beta readers the editing the first second drafts first drafts are a disaster just understand that and you're going to be fine. It's really just getting to the final draft that is the goal. Mr. Steve Ramirez, thank you so much for honoring my invitation. Thank you so much for a great interview. You've dished out so much value and I'm really delighted that I got to speak with you today. Thank you so, so much. Oh, thank you, Joseph. It was a real pleasure meeting you. And thank you for all of your kind words. I really appreciate it. I'm so happy you enjoyed the book. So guys, thank you so much for staying all through. You've heard about the book, you've seen the author, and it's your turn to go get your copy of this amazing fantasy novel. I really, really do endorse it. I so much enjoyed this novel, and I want you guys to go check it out. And to save you time, I've included a link to the book in the description of this video. So go check that out. Thank you so much for staying true. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next week. Bye for now.